Hello and welcome to another episode of Game Theory, the number one DraftKings prep show in all of the land. I am your host, Monk, aka the Monk Petition. And in this very episode, you guys, we are going to be breaking down all 13 fights coming up this weekend, the 16th at the Apex Center for UFC Vegas 51. And we're going to be breaking it down from a DraftKings perspective, getting you all the, the notes and stats that you need to get some takedowns this weekend. So, first things first, guys, please. Take a look at teamriserfall.com. Head on over there. We have a ton of experts in every single sport for DFS. I believe it literally is every single sport from football, NASCAR, baseball's going again. We even have uh, esports going on over there. So take a look at what the experts have to say. Have to say, we have guys posting winning tickets daily. Members in the chat, uh, the experts themselves posting stuff daily. So be sure to check that out. Use code Monk M O N K. For ten dollars off a membership also be sure to check out mma engine on youtube and twitter subscribe over there it's me brady uncle wheezy and at lou bet ya. we are bringing you guys a product that is going to be second to none in the meantime we have content coming out pretty much five days a week in regards to every single card um that's going on for the ufc so be sure to check that out and lastly like this video it really helps a ton subscribe to the channel i'm five subscribers away you guys from 200 so let's hit that <clears throat> excuse me let's hit that land uh landmark milestone whatever and be sure to comment down below what's your favorite part what's your favorite stat or uh what would you like to see on this show so without further ado guys business is out of the way let's get into the first fight of the night oh man i had it set up there we go let me ditch this keyboard first fight of the night is going to be kevin crash Kroom going against highly alatang um, I'm going to try to go a little bit quicker than usual on this one. I got four videos to record tonight. Uh, this is the very first one. So Kevin Kroom, two fights in the, three fights in the UFC, rather one, no contest. He is 0 and 2, 7,400 this week. Excuse me. He is $467 over his average salary. Big red flag, 2.44 points per minute. Gives up 3.9 points uh, per minute. Highly Alatang, $8,800 guys. This is the cursed salary. I even shouted it out last week. Excuse me, I think I'm got a little chest congestion. I think I'm coming down with some. Um, see, so here are the raw DraftKings points per minute graphs. Kroom above his opponent and trending up. What you like to see. Alatang well below his opponent, trending up slightly, but his opponent trending much steeper than he is. 
And here are my projections, some pretty low projections, uh, no matter what, not even 100 points in a first round finish win. So I am going to be fading this fight, you guys. Here's the DraftKings visual recap and aggregate uh, finish percentages. So nothing much to look at at the graph. We don't have any wins for uh, Kevin Crew. And then the finish percentages, uh, over 50% in their careers. No finishes in the UFC so far. So yeah, I'm thinking this is going to be a big fade. I don't want Kevin Kroom in this fight. If I'm picking, I'm picking Haile Alatang for the takedown and control time overall grappling upside. But $8,800, it just won last week. It is still a cursed salary, winning at 70%, but only making the optimal at about 22% of those wins. So give me a fade on the first fight of the night. Um, if I'm doing, you know, 5, 20, 150 lineups, people seem to like that setup last week. If I'm doing 5, 0. Of each guy. If I'm doing 20, maybe highly Alatang in one or two lineups. If I'm doing 150, um, I'm gonna have a tough time getting Kroom in any of those lineups uh for a GPP. Highly Alatang, you know, 10%, no more than 10% top. So I'd keep it pretty low. Let's go on to the next one, guys. I do expect Highly Alatang to win the fight, and so does Computer Monk. Which, by the way, stick around for the end of the video. I will be showing the uh, Computer Monk's picks for this week. And he did do pretty well last week after coming off of uh, not UFC 273, but the week before that. I think it was UFC Columbus. Had, he went like 4 of 12. 4 wins, 8 incorrect picks. This week, spoiler alert, 11 and 1, baby. Let's go. A big rebound. So stick around for the end of the video and check that out. Next fight, Sam. Sam Page. Huge. Hughes. Fantastic nickname going against Estela Nunez. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to be fading this one too. Neither of these women have a UFC win. 0 oh and 4 combined. Sam Hughes is 0 oh and 3. If she loses this, surely she's out of the UFCs, right? Uh, $7,300 for Sam Hughes. 2.17 points per minute. Average value of 3.62. And you are paying up for Sam Hughes. Her average salary is 7000 She's at 7300 this week. Again, red flag when you only score two points a minute uh no wins gives up 95 points when she loses excuse me that is a big number for strawweight division still a nunez 8900 dollars. i mean yeah she's probably going to win the fight but what are you getting for 8900 let's start there first of all you're paying 1200 over her previous salary of 77 2.47 points per minute allows 4.64 points a minute average value of 4.16 uh, gave up 105 points when she lost. So, I mean, maybe I can't fade this fight. Maybe the winner of this fight is going to score very well because both of the neither of these women uh, seemingly can play any kind of fight defense uh, at all. They just allow points left and right. I mean, we're almost at, you know, we're at an average of like 4.2 points between them, given up. Uh, neither one has logged a takedown in the UFC. Hughes has 0.4 points a minute worth of control time. Stella Nunes scored no points as far as grappling, and that fight did go 12 point, so 13 minutes, pretty much, against Ariane Carnalosi. She subbed her, I believe, yeah. I believe it was a rear naked choke, but I don't have that uh, in front of me. Let's see. So, yeah, just no points scored offensively for either of these women, and a ton of points given up. Um, if I have to pick a side, because I'm going to wrap this one up, I'm probably going with Estella Nunes. I don't see how anyone could back Sam Hughes. With their, I mean, if you're betting this fight, 1-800-GAMBLER, first of all, shame on you. Um, other than that, for DraftKings, I really don't like, I mean, how can you put Sam Hughes in a lineup 0-3? I mean, we're in like Sean Soriano territory, basically, here. Uh, you just can't roster that type of fighter. Even if you think they're going to win, they have not shown at this level that they can do that. So I'm probably going to go with Estela Nunes here. She is one inch shorter, but has a two-inch reach advantage. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to go with Nunez here. I don't like any of the numbers. Big fade all around. I mean, both these women are getting outscored. Both trending up, though, so you do like to see that. Very low projections. I mean, first round is over 100, I guess. So that's just because I shouldn't say very low projections. Both of them give up so many points that their projections are higher than usual. Here are some graphs. You can completely ignore the first one because neither of these women have a win. I only track wins in that graph. And then the uh, finish percentages in their career, over 50% wins and losses and then no wins but 50 percent losses in their finishes so or in the ufc i mean have been finished losses 5 20 150 uh none in five 20 max i'm probably gonna play 
I mean, maybe, no, Nunez is too much. Nope, none in 20. Um, less than 5% Nunez in GPPs, 150. She's too expensive. I don't know what she's going to bring. Um, I mean, one of these women could get an early not, uh, finish. Who knows? They're both giving up a ton of points, but I just don't trust it. I think it's going to go to decision more often than not uh, with very low scores. Probably Nunez winning with like an 80, probably doesn't even hit 10x. Um, that's where I would be putting my money. Next fight. Jordan Levitt, the Monkey King, is back against UFC newcomer Trey Ogden. He has no Dana White Contender Series fights. No, nothing. Just first fight in the UFC. And you get Jordan Levitt at a $7,900 salary. Um, I believe Ogden, I have to do my fight tape still, but I believe Ogden um, is a pretty decent ground fight. Like, can take you, is a good wrestler, take you down wrestling base. Um, and can hold you down. So that's pretty much as much, uh, pretty much as much as I know at this point, I do need to do my fight tape as do you pair it with this video. And you guys are sure to take money home this weekend. Um, so I'm not going to go into Trey Ogden cause I personally don't know a ton about him. I don't want to tell you guys a bunch of lies. Here's what I do know. He's a very experienced professional record, 15 and four as a pro 11 wins out of 15 by submission three losses by sub. So no knockout wins or losses. So yeah, I'd say uh, it's a pretty safe bet to say that he's a ground fighter. Um, so Levitt will have to be careful of that. Meanwhile, Levitt is $7,900. He is $900 cheaper than his average salary. So there you go. Uh, he, he has three fights worth of UFC experience as well. 22 minutes in the octagon. He's $900 cheaper than usual. 3.5 points a minute. That is the fifth best number on the card. Gives up just over three points a minute. Um, 103 points when he wins. That is over two wins. That's the second highest number on the card. Gives up only 86 when he lost. Um, and when he did lose, he also scored 57. So Levitt might not be a bad cash play here. He's got the number one floor on the card, $7,900. So that is a dog salary. So might be decent play for cash here, Jordan Levitt. And people, I don't know, people just don't think much about him. So I think he could be a little bit under owned this week. Maybe. And probably a lot of people on Trey Ogden as well. Um, although fading wrestle heavy UFC newcomers in their debut fight has uh, recently has not been a good look. So you'll have to keep that in mind. When Levitt wins by knockout 120 when he won by sub, only 86. Uh, one of his fights he did score over 110. The other one was less than 90. Obviously, I said that out loud. Um, scores a ton of takedown points and control time points. 0.89 points a minute and 0.39 points a minute respectively. But he gives up 2.01 points per minute in takedowns and control time points. So who knows? One way or the other, this one is going to the ground. Um, Levitt has six sub wins professionally. Uh, so these guys between themselves uh, are between each other. 24 uh, pro wins. 17 of them have been uh, by way of submission victory. So it's going to kind of be a sub battle, I believe. So here are the stats. They're all green over here as I have nothing for Trey Ogden. Here is the strength of schedule. Levitt four and one. Ogden also four and one, but Ogden with a much lighter strength of schedule, as you can see, not even sixty in these three main categories. Whereas Levitt's not looking great, but he is seventy in one of them and just below in the actual strength of schedule category. Uh, coming off a win over Matt Sales and then Matt Wyman lost in the middle of those two to Claudio Puelas. Two finish wins for him in the UFC. And then here is the Raw DraftKings points per minute graph where Levitt is above his opponents and trending up. Here are my projections. Pretty low for Ogden, but I'm just using the average for the division to get his projections because he has no UFC fights to base anything off of. That is the average for the division. And then Levitt is based off of Levitt's stats. And here is the visual statistical recap, which we still can't look at because Ogden has no fights. So we'll move it on to career finishing percentages. Very high. In wins, 75% of their wins have been by finish, all by submission, as we said. 60% of their losses have been by submissions as well. And then Levitt finishing both his fights in the UFC. I don't know. I'm going to have to keep my options open here. I actually like Levitt this week just because we, you know, the high variance of Trey Ogden. And I really think Ogden is going to be higher owned than Levitt. So give me Levitt. I mean, in five lineups, give me, you know, one of each probably. One guy in one lineup and one guy in the other. Uh, 20 lineups, probably, you know, four with Levitt, maybe five, six, seven with Ogden, something like that. 
and GPPs, 150s, give me like 10% Levitt, maybe double that of Ogden, 20, 25% just for the takedown upside because you've got to play that takedown upside. Um, what do we have as far as Levitt? Yeah, so you got to play both guys for takedown upside. Maybe even 15% Levitt, 20%, or maybe 20 and 20, something like that. But I, I like this fight for DraftKings um, just for the takedown upside and possible submission finish. So that's how I would be playing this one. Next fight, Chris Beast Boy Barnett going against UFC newcomer Martin Boudet. He did, Boudet did fight Dana White contender series fight. That's why his name is yellow up here. That's why he does have a one and zero UFC record. And it says he has a UFC fight. It is a Dana White contender series fight as are all of these scores. So this is his UFC debut, $9,000, pretty pricey for a UFC debutante. But in his DWCS fight, he scored 7.26 points a minute, allowed only 1.05 and the fight did finish in the first round, but at the very, very end of the first round. So he got almost five full minutes of stats in there. 125.8 points is what he would have scored. My goodness. Chris Barnett on the other side. Everybody's favorite. I mean, how do you not love this guy? $7,200. 2.77 points per minute. Gets outscored um, 3.26 to 2.77. So almost a half a point per minute differential. 96.76 when he wins, and in his one loss, he gave up 105.09. Uh, I'll keep this one short because I do not have a lot of stats for these guys. Only one or two UFC fights for Barnett and one Dana White Contender Series fight for Martin Boudet. Um, I like Boudet here. I like the upside. I like the knockout upside. Uh, Barnett has been finished by a KO, TKO three times in his career. And Boudet, that's his bread and butter, you know, 70 uh, seventy percent of his professional fights have come by way of him knocking someone out. So I do like that angle of it. Um, the only thing I don't know what Martin Boudet's uh, cardio looks like. So Barnett was able, I believe. When did he finish John Volante? Second round. Yeah, second round. I mean, I'm sure he was probably tired, but Volante was freaking gassed so we'll have to see what boudet looks like if Bar the longer barnett survives the better it is for barnett um but i will be rostering boudet he's never uh been knocked out probably not going to be rostering too much of barnett um here are the graphs here i mean boudet's is off the chart barnett getting outscored but trending up here are my projections obviously much higher for martin boudet and the graphs, we each have a win. Actually, you know, it's a Dana White Contender Series fight, but still pretty good chunk of real estate here for Boudet. Then the aggregate win-loss finish rates, tons of finishes, tons. Well over 50%. I'm sure Computer Monks th thinks this one is going to finish inside the distance. Um, give me Boudet to win and give me Boudet. I'm going to be reaching for him for a priority pick this week. I think five lineups. I'm playing him in probably three uh, Barnett in five lineups, maybe one. Cause he's a heavyweight, but maybe a half a lineup. You know what I mean? On average uh, 20 lineups. Give me one or two with Barnett. Give me 10 to 12 with Boudet, I think. And then one fifty is probably about the same. Give me, you know, five to 8% Chris Barnett. Give me close to probably 50, probably 50 to 55% Boudet. I think he's going to get the knockout victory, $9,000. I think he pays off that salary, and it is a pretty good salary to play. So give me the finish upside of Boudet over Chris Barnett, which is unfortunate because I would like to see him do a front flip onto his ass again. What a move. Oh, as a big man, I wish I could you know, move like that. But hey, I don't think we're going to see it this week. Next fight, we have Rafa Garcia going. It's not Rafa Garcia. He's from Mexico. He's not Brazilian. Rafa Garcia going against Jesse. Ron, it's Jesse Hansen. He, I'm just kidding. It's Jesse Ronson, uh, who has his own name and his own birthday tattooed on him. Um, so unless something uh, else happened on that day, that's a pretty questionable tattoo in my opinion. But to each their own. Jesse Ronson. $8,000. He is 0-3 in the UFC with one no contest. I believe he won that fight, but it was ruled a no contest because of some anabolic steroid. But then I, you know, I looked into it and supposedly it was a tainted supplement and not straight up steroid use. So who knows? Either way, no UFC wins. 1.96 points per minute for $8,000. He gets outscored by a point and a half per minute allowing 3.46 back at him. Average value of 3.35. He is $1,000 over his average salary. 
$1,000 over. Oh, also, he hasn't fought in 627 days by the time. Actually, no, 626 by the time you see this on Tuesday. I mean, that's basically, you know, how many months is that? 20 months, pretty much? It's ridiculous. Uh, so hasn't fought in forever, ha does not have a UFC win, does not score two points a minute. Get him out of here. I'm fading him 100%. I don't want any part of Jesse Ronson, and that's all I'm going to say about him for the rest of this segment. Rafa Garcia, $8,200. So all those shitty stats for uh, Jesse Ronson, you're getting decent stats for Garcia, and you're only paying $200 more than Jesse Ronson. And Garcia's only $200 over his average salary. Bonus, 3.42 points per minute. That's what Ronson gives up. Garcia allows only 2.93 for a positive half point per minute differential. 93 points in his one UFC win. Only gave up 77 and a half over his two UFC losses. So one was to Chris Gritzmacher, I believe. Uh, and that was when Rafa Garcia was the $9,500 salary. So really bad look there to lose uh, the only time that $6,700 salary has won since last January of 2021 was this that fight. Rafa Garcia and Chris Gritzmacher. Um, other than that, I, I like Rafa Garcia here. I love, 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 love the takedown upside. 1.33 points per minute just in takedowns. Guys, that is number one on the entire card. Half a point per minute in control time. That's the fifth best number. And look at Jesse Ronson. I promised I wasn't going to talk about him anymore, but I'll, I'll say some bad, more bad numbers. Allows 1.26 takedown points per minute, 0.68 control time points per minute. That's all I'm going to say about it. Put Rafa Garcia in your lineup. I love him at $8,200. I love, love him for cash. 100%. Ronson, 61.29% takedown defense. Allows 3.77 takedowns per 15 minutes. I mean, Rafa Garcia should murder this dude. 27% control time for Rafa Garcia only allowed less than 2%. Meanwhile, 5% for Ronson control time allowed 38% control time. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Rafa Garcia, 72. So he has a good strength of schedule too. Very good. Ronson, decent, but under 70. So not, not great. A lot of red in these columns for both of these guys. Um, I like Rafa Garcia to start his win streak, get on that two in a row train. Um, decent looking graph from uh, Rafa Garcia. Terrible for Ronson. Oh, just awful. Here are my projections. Much higher, about 10 points higher for Garcia in a few of these, as you would expect. DraftKings visual recap, only one guy with a win, so skip that. Ronson's making this easy to skip. Uh, Garcia, I mean, look at these numbers. Percent finishes in wins professional career between the two of them. And Jesse Ronson is very experienced. Don't get me wrong. He is 0-3 with one no contest in the UFC. He's 21-10 and in his professional career. So he's got 31, 32 fights. Uh, 73 and a half of them have ended in finish wins from these guys. 25% finish losses. I mean, tons of finishes here. I think Garcia is going to take him down over and over again. I mean, Kevin Lee landed four takedowns on this guy. Michael Prezera has landed seven takedowns on this guy. Granted, that was in 2013. Yeah, we've got a 2013 fight, 2014, 2014, and then six years plus, six years and three weeks, we get 2020. So, and that was the no contest against Nicholas Dalby. So give me the big fade on Jesse Ronson. Uh, zero, you know, in five, 20, and 150 lineups, zero percent. I won't have him in any lineups. Too expensive. Rafa Garcia, on the other hand, 8,200. Really like Rafa Garcia. Uh, in five lineups, I'm probably playing him in two or three. Uh, in 20 lineups, I'm playing him in 40 to 50%, probably. Right around there, depending on what I need for salary. Uh, and then 150, 150 maxes give me, you know, probably about the same, 40 to 50%, maybe 35 to 45%. But again, it depends on what I need for salary. I mean, I'm planning on playing a couple of the $9,000 guys, a couple of them I really don't like, kind of the opposite of last week. But if I need some salary uh, space, I could fill a couple holes with uh, the $8,200 salary. Next fight, we are going Drakkar close against Brandon Jenkins. This is another one. I don't even know why you would be on the Jenkins side. He is uh, only one UFC fight, so I guess we don't. You'd be banking on him. Um, you know, more on his professional experience, which is 23 fights worth compared to his UFC record. But he is 6,800, the lowest salary on the card. Scored only 1.83 points in his uh, almost 15 full minutes of his only UFC fight. Gave up almost seven 
points per minute in 14 and a half minutes, guys. Seven points a minute. Who did he fight? Rong Zhu, the dude with pink hair that got his ass whooped a few months ago. Yeah, scored seven points a minute on Brandon Jenkins. Um, He's going to be the taller fighter over close three inches taller, one inch reach advantage. But I like close here. 2.91 points a minute, 2.62 allowed. It's only 78 per win. Um, so this might be a big fade to both sides. Uh, Drakkar Close is so expensive because Brandon Jenkins is terrible. Like, really bad. And you're paying $100 over his average. It's basically the same. Uh, but Drakkar Close, you are paying significant money over his average. 12.5 or... Wow. $1,257 over his average salary. That's just ridiculous. The guy's never scored 100 points. He's only scored over 90 in two of his five wins. I'm going to be fading the shit out of this fight overall. Um, Close's numbers are so much better than Jenkins in every way. He just does not score well. He did score 98 uh, against Christos Giagos, but that was probably the only time. No, two, two wins he's put up over 90, so... Um, that was one of them coming off a loss to loss to Benil Dariush about, oh, at this point, a year, 13 months ago. Uh, and then wins over Giagos. Got a win over Bobby Green, which is aging better by the day. And here are a couple of graphs. Well, Brandon Jenkins doesn't mean anything because it's just one fight. But Drakkar Close is above his opponent's average and trending up. Opponent trending up much, much higher, though. Not what you like to see. Then some projections here, very high for Drakkar Close. But again, that's because Brandon Jenkins averages seven points per minute given up. Uh, and then the visual statistical recap doesn't mean anything because Jenkins has no UFC wins. Seems to be a, a pattern on this card. And then the aggregate professional career finishing percentages, pretty high, 65.38% in wins, 40% in losses. And then in the UFC, two-thirds of their losses have been by finish. Guys, I did say I liked a couple of the 9,000 guys this week. Drakkar Close is not one of them. I just can't pay that much money for a 78.41 uh, win average. I mean, come on. He, he, he has good defense, but has allowed only 79.85 points over his two losses. But, I mean, come on. Um, Brandon Jenkins did. I mean, Rong Zhu scored 146 points on this guy. So, maybe I can't fade car close all the way i'm fa fading why can't i speak right now i am fading brandon jenkins 100 percent uh give me no part of brandon jenkins the car close in five lineups i'm not playing him in any maybe one maybe one 20 lineups give me him three max 150 man i think a lot of people are going to be on him he could score well but if this goes to decision I don't know, Rong Zhu scored a shitload of points on this guy, man. What did he give up for takedown points? He gives up two points. Oh, my God. He gave up three point, uh, two, three points per minute on the ground against Rong Zhu. Over 15 minutes almost. All right, give me 10 to 15% close. I can't go much higher than that, man. 9,400. I can't risk the decision. 78 points, even the average of 78 and 146 is still, you know, I guess it is overall. So 10 to 15 to 20% close tops at 150s. Next fight, Penny Kianza going against Lena Landsberg. I haven't said that name in a while. That's because she hasn't fought in 200 and, or I'm sorry, 808 days. So over to almost two and a quarter, two years and four months or three months, if I could count right. Uh, Penny Kianzad, four and three in the UFC. Let me go all the way up. She is $9,100. Scores only 2.66 points a minute. Gets three points a minute scored on her. I mean, come on. What are we doing here? She is over $1,000 over her average salary, guys, of 8000 This is insane. Average value of 6.73. Record is four and three. She scores 75 points per win. Allows 83.66 when she loses. Man, the bookies must just be thinking that Lena Landsberg shouldn't even be in here and that Kianzad is going to go off on her. Yeah, Kianzad's never even scored 90 points in the UFC. No finish wins, four decision wins, that's it. Three, or sorry, one finish loss. Lena Landsberg, two knockout losses. So I guess that's what Kianzad would be going for. She has no sub wins. 
So she would be looking for that, I suppose. Landsberg, 2.44 points per minute. Oh, she's only 7,100. So she is $500 cheaper than her, excuse me, than her average. Landsberg in four UFC losses, giving up an average of 107.06 or 107.64 points a win for her opponent. I mean, wow, this is what I mean. So you can't fade Kianzad into nothing because Landsberg just gives points out. 107 per loss. That is insane, especially for this weight class. Um, she has scored, Landsberg only scored 90 over uh, one win out of four. That's it. Allows 0.67 takedown points per minute, 0.82 control time points per minute. But Kianza doesn't do either of those things. She is a striker. At least that's what she's shown in the UFC so far. Um, these women are actually pretty close, I guess. But Kianza pretty much ruling everywhere um, in stats that matter. Landsberg only 50% takedown defense. Kianza 77. So much better takedown defense. Landsberg much better strength of schedule by at least five points in about every category. Uh, but she again, she hasn't fought in two years, three months. They come on. Her last win was Macy Chiesa on uh, September of 2019. She beat Tanya Evinger right before that. That tells you how long ago this was. Half of you probably have never even heard that name before. Um, I'm not trying to slam you. I'm just saying it's been that long since, you know, Lena Landsberg has fought. Gonzad coming off a loss to Raquel Pennington. Very close fight. But before that, four straight wins over JRC, uh, Besh Kohea, Jara Eubanks, and Alexis Davis. So I think she gets this one pretty easily. Um, I'm going to be playing zero percentage of Lena Landsberg. Here are my projections. Here are the graphs. I mean, no finish wins in the UFC for either of these women. Huge chunk of the graph missing. That is a main reason I will be fading this fight uh, overall. I just don't get any finishes. This is probably going to go to decision. If it doesn't go to decision, it's probably going to be Lena Landsberg that gets finished by some ground and pound or, yeah, probably ground and pound, uh, you know, second round maybe, unless she comes back and just looks absolutely awful. Could get a first round finish for Kianzad. Um, so for that reason, fading Lena Landsberg into, into nothing. Five lineups for Kianzad, give me one maybe. 20 lineups, give me, I don't know, three to four. 9100 just for that upside that finish upside early finish upside against lena landsberg who is 40 years old has not fought in over two years huge upside uh as far as finishes go and then 150 max i don't know uh probably 20 20 percent 20 to 25 percent uh panty counts on so she was not one of the high salary fighters i was talking about earlier but after seeing the stats, you're going to have to consider her uh, for roster. 100%. Next fight, William Knight going against Devin Clark. And I believe this is a heavyweight fight. So William Knight not going to miss weight um, by like 45 pounds again. And Devin Clark is just like, I'm just not going to cut. So works out perfectly. Clark is 6-6 six and six in the UFC. $8,600 salary here. I don't know what to do with this fight. Um, I assume you have to play it just because of the finish upside, um, especially for William Knight. But, I mean, Devin Clark has a few finishes in his career as well, but he is mostly a decision fighter. In fact, he hasn't had a decision or a finish since I mean, he got finished by Anthony Smith and Ryan Spann, but I don't even know the last time he had a finish. Uh, $8,600, so he's a decent scorer at 3.85 points per minute. That is the second highest rate on the entire card. Only ends up with 94.36, so this is a pretty low-scoring card. That is fifth highest. Um, he is $755 over his average salary. Only gives up 2.51 points a minute for a decent differential of 1.34. And by decent, I mean third best, so more than decent. Uh, William Knight, 7,600, has made the optimal lineup in one of his four fights since this date, January 1st, 2021. 2.53 points per minute offensively, gives up over three points a minute defensively, scores only 90 in his wins, 88 when he loses. So this is what I mean. Like, what do you do here? William Knight is also 360 under his average salary. I mean, he has nine knockout wins in his career, but only one in the UFC. Five of his, let's see, or I'm sorry, four of his five fights have gone to decision. So what am I expecting here? Um, a decision? win for Devin Clark 
or a decision win a decision win for William Knight what does that look like um probably not a decision win for Knight probably a late knockout win um if I was going to have to guess I mean both of these guys give up tons of takedown and control time points each one I mean Devin Clark is decent takedown and control time offense 0.84 points a minute and 0.64 points a minute respectively uh, and that's about what William Knight is giving up. So if Clark can keep this one on the ground, um, it's going to go, it's going to pay dividends, I should say. Um, so give me, I guess, Clark for the upside. I am going to have to play these guys, both of them, though. I can't just fade. I've faded too many fighters already. Probably don't need to fade these guys. William Knight has a fantastic strength of schedule. It's probably his best attribute. I mean, he's not fighting anybody, you know, that's a world beater. But I mean, Daun Jung's on his record. Um, Alonzo Menafield has a decent record. Uh, Maxim Grishin has a ton of wins. So, I mean, has a decent strength of schedule. Devin Clark, a little bit below that, but still right at about that 70 mark. Both guys two and three. Sorry, Devin Clark, two and three in his last five. William Knight, three and two. And then here's our DraftKings points per minute graph with William over his opponent. Trending down, however. And then let's see, we have Devin Clark well above his opponent and trending down actually while his opponents trend up. So I and Kutalaba messed him up pretty bad in that last fight, in case you didn't see that picture of his team. Yikes. Not look that up. Uh, here are my projections. So whatever you think is going to happen, here's how I think it will score. And then the DraftKings visual statistical recap looks pretty good for Knight. Big chunk of the graph missing for Clark as he has no UFC finish wins. Um... Oh, I was looking at something wrong. Sorry. Uh, and then let's see. Tons of finish wins and losses uh, as far as their professional careers go. Many fewer percentage points as far as wins in the UFC that have been finished. Uh, but they do get finished in the UFC. So, can't fade this fight. It's going to be a heavyweight fight. I do think some... Hmm, I think it's either going to be a Clark decision in which he scores, you know, maybe 95 points. It could be decent. Uh, does he score any by knockdown? He has knocked down once or twice in his career, but only 0.15 knockdown points per minute. So I do expect him to land a few takedowns, uh, especially on William Knight if he can't move around as much because he looked pretty slow in that last one. And uh, Clark's going to want to take him down to avoid the crazy, tremendous power from William Knight, the second highest power index on the card. So I would not want to stand on the feet with this guy. So he'll want to take him down. Give me the takedown upside of Devin Clark. 8,600 is a tremendous salary to play for DraftKings and Salary Voodoo. Uh, 76 isn't bad either. I just don't see how William Knight, um, short of a round one knockout on Devin Clark, uh, is going to score well. So maybe half, five lineups, give me half, half a one for William Knight on average. Give me like one to two for Devin Clark. 20 lineups, give me one or two in Knight and, you know, five to eight maybe six to 10 for Clark. That's too high. Five to eight, I think is fine. One fifties. I think that's a good percentage, like 30%, right around 30%. That's probably going to be his ownership too. So right around there, I would be fine with give or take a few percentages. Next fight, we are skipping uh, Dos Santos. That one is off. So five fights left. Pat Sabatini, one of my favorite plays this week. Spoiler alert, going against TJ Laramie. I uh, won't talk about TJ Laramie much. He is 0-1 in the UFC. Just know he got worked on. First round finish. He is $7,000 this week. He scored only 0.79 points per minute and averaged. Gave up 7.83 per minute on average. I know it's a very small uh, sample size. Less than one minute of a fight. Uh, but he got worked over. Who was it? Derek Minner subbed him. Lickety split. Um... Excuse me, Laramie was 9200 in that fight. He's now $7,000. Uh, so if you like the upside of him, go ahead. He's 2200 his average salary, but um, I don't think he stands much of a chance against Pat Sabatini. $9,200 ma has made an optimal in his last three fights. Excuse me, best pace on the entire card, over four points a minute. Gives up only 1.64 points a minute, guys. 92.73 points per win. That is over three UFC wins. He has gotten a finish in one of those. Almost an 11 average value. And he's only coming in $733 over his average. That's not terrible. Not terrible at all. Uh, two of three wins he's put up over 90. One of three he's put up over 100. 
uh, second highest takedown points per minute, 0.94 over a point, 1.18 control time points per minute. Give me Pat Sabatini all day. He even has reversals in there. He even has knockdowns in there. Give me the upside of Pat Sabatini all day. Um, TJ Laramie, I'll have him in zero lineups. Uh, even if he looks tremendously better than he did against Derek Minner, uh, Pat Sabatini has a huge wrestling submission upside, just like Derek Minner. Uh, 10 wins have come by way of submission for Sabatini. Uh, Laramie's been finished once by sub, and that was in his very last fight. So let's keep the ball rolling. Both these guys' strength of schedule is not good, but Sabatini has no defeats in his last five just under 70 as far as strength of schedule with wins over Tucker Lutz, submitted Jamal Emmers, and beat Tristan Connolly by unanimous decision. Here are the raw DraftKings points per minute graph with Sabatini well over above his opponents and trending up. Here are my projections. Very, very high for Sabatini. Probably the highest projections on the card. That's because he takes people down whenever he wants pretty much. And TJ Laramie gave up a ton of points per minute in his very short fight. And the aggregate professional and UFC career finishing percentages, very high in wins. 75% of these guys' wins have come by way of finish. 57% of their losses, 100% of their losses in the UFC. Give me Pat Sabatini. Um, I don't even care if it's by finish or if it goes to decision. If this goes to decision, I think he's just going to keep taking TJ Laramie down. He's going to be working submissions. He's going to be, you know, hopefully chain wrestling to get him on the ground. Um... And if he finds a finish, great. That's bonus points. If he doesn't, that's just more time. Work that four points a minute. Um, so this is one of the guys I was talking about when I said I like the $9,000 guys. Give me a bunch of Sabatini. I mean, three, four lineups out of five. Out of 20, give me 14. Out of 150, I mean, I'm playing 70% of this guy. 70% probably. Uh, I love him in this spot. 9,200, he's the third most expensive fighter on the card. His average per win isn't great, but nobody's is this card. So give me Pat Sabatini. Next fight, Myra Bueno Silva going against Wu Yanan. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to be fading. Actually, God, I don't even know. Wu Yanan, one and three in the UFC. Yeah, I'm going to be fading Wu Yanan here. She scores only 2.68 points per minute, gives up 3.76. She is $625 under her average salary. Uh, DraftKings points per win on average, 101.39. That is just one win, however. And let's look at who that was against. Lauren Mueller, she's not in the UFC anymore. Um, when uh, Wu Yanan loses, gives up 88.24 points in a loss. Silva on the other side. Scores only two points a minute, and she is $9,300, guys. Two points per minute. Um, scores 93 when she wins. So she does have two submission victories. Uh, Wu Yanan never been subbed in her career, for the record. And when Silva loses, gives up 99.51. For both these ladies, given up, you know, pretty close to 90 um, when they lose. Neither one scoring well. And, I mean, the 2.02 from Myra Bueno Silva is terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, let's see, Wu Yanan had that one good performance. Silva has yet to score over 100 points. Um, no takedown points for Silva, all striking. Opponent takedown points per minute, 0.86 uh, is what she gives up. And Silva also gives up 0.77 in control time. Wu Yanan, not that big of a threat on the ground, 0.2 control, uh, takedown points and 0.35 control time points. But she does have you know a submission victory and knows her way a little bit around the ground. Guys, I'm going to keep this one short as well. I think this one ends by decision. Um, look at these strength of schedules. They're absolute trash. And Silva's better in every category, and one of them is a 57. So absolute trash. Um, I mean, she's two, two, and one in her last five. Wu Yanan, one and three in her last five. Is that all the fights she has? That's impossible. Oh no, she's two and three in her last five. My bad. Um, I mean, Silva did beat Jillian Robertson, Mara Romello uh Barella. But Wu Yanan losing to G uh, Gina Mazzani. Mizuki, anyway, Mizuki and Jocelyn Edwards, not great looks there. So, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm going to fade this one. I don't like this fight for DraftKings at all. I mean, Myra Bueno Silva is getting outscored by more than double what she's putting out. Here are my projections. The graphs are very similar as well. But I think this one's going to be pretty close. Both a bit of uh, kind of submission fighters, but they like, they don't get to the ground much. Um, both have victories by submission. 
not very good as far as takedowns go. Let's see, takedown defense actually for Silva, 71%, 66 for Wu Yunan, so not terrible, but not great. Um, I think this one probably stays on the feet more often than not, and I think it also goes to decision more often than not. I will have none of Wu Yunan probably. Five lineups, 20 lineups, 0%. Maybe in one GPPs I'll have, you know, up to 5%, maybe. I don't know why I would, though. But it's much. her numbers are much better than Bueno Silva almost all around. So I hate Buena Silva for the 90, at the $9,300 salary. I think she is way, way overpriced, and I'm going to have a very hard time rostering her. Why would you roster her when you could pay $100 less and put Pat Sabatini in your lineup? That's just one man's opinion. Uh, Wu Yunan never been... Actually, that's not true. She's been <laughs> knocked out five times in her career. Wow. Uh, but Silva only one win by way of knockout TKO out of uh, 10 fights. So I don't really expect that. Babble, babble. Next fight, Miguel Baeza going against Andre Fialo. Um, this one could be interesting. Fialo looked not great against uh, Michel Pajera, but... Uh, you know, held his own and went to a decision with him. So he's coming in $7,500. I might use him as a little bit of salary relief this week. He does have 11 knockout wins in his career. Um, only one UFC fight, however. 1.33 points per minute. That is not a, gr a great look. Uh, gave up 3.34 to uh, Michel Pajeda. Uh, coming in $400 over his average salary or his previous salary. So you are paying up for him after that abysmal performance uh, score-wise that we saw from him in that Pajeda fight. Miguel Baeza, I mean, powerful guy. Fifth highest power index on the card. $8,700, so you are paying for that power. You get almost three points per minute, gives up uh, only 2.17 per minute. 8.07 value, scores just over, just a hair over 100 points in his wins, uh, and gives up only 78 when he loses. So pretty decent numbers from Miguel Baeza. Let's see here. 103 when he won by knockout. 93 when he won by submission. So three UFC finishes here in all three of his UFC wins. You do like to see that. Did get finished, however, in one of those uh, losses. To who was it? Yep. No. Was that a finish? No. He went to decision. Where are the rest of my? Uh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, Baiza got finished in his last fight against Chaos Williams. I believe it was the third round. Yep. So Williams started to pour it on. Maybe Fialo can use that same game plan. Uh, depends on what Fialo's cardio looks like. That is what I would be worried about here. Uh, Baeza, three wins over 100. One of them, or sorry, three wins over 90. One of them over 100. And then Fialo only gave up how many points? 80 in his loss. So a pretty good defensive showing from Fialo, only giving up 80 points. In what was kind of an ass whooping. Um, I mean, he got hit with 7.13 strikes per minute in that fight. Uh, Baeza gets hit with a lot as well, 4.68 per minute. So not a very defensively sound fighter here. Baeza uh, controlling 64% of the gra uh, grappling time, but Fialo controlled over 50% of that same grappling time against um, Pajeda. So Fialo 4-1 and one in his last five, Baeza 3-2 and two with two losses in a row. So you know he's looking for that victory over Fialo. I got a funny feeling that Fialo looks okay here against Baeza. Uh, he is two inches shorter, but they have the same reach. So it's going to be interesting to see who wins the pace battle. Whoever can establish their pace, I believe, is going to win the first round. And that, this first round is going to be very important. Because um, if one guy starts to slow down because of the cardio and they gas themselves out, I think the other one's going to have no problem taking over. And uh, I think one of them's going to fade quickly. Quickly over that next round, I mean. So... I'll be looking maybe for a finish in this one. Here are the raw DraftKings points per minute. Baeza well over his opponents, but trending way down. Here are my projections. So whatever you think is going to happen, here's how I think it will score. And then the DraftKings visual statistical recap. Again, sorry, I don't have any uh, wins for Fialo. You have nothing to compare this to. And then here are the professional career finishing percentages for Baeza and Fialo. Many, many finish wins, 83%. So what's that? Something out of 24? I don't even know. 20? 21? Something like that. Um, tons of finish losses in their uh, professional careers. UFC, 100% of their wins, and that's all Baeza, and then 33% of their losses. So this one is going to be a good fight, guys. Don't miss this one. Welterweight fight. I thought Fialo looked 
okay against Pajeda in his debut. Um, I think he hopefully worked on some of the right things, improved that cardio a bit. I think he has a chance to beat Baeza here. I also think Baeza could be expen too expensive this week. If Pajeda didn't get him out, I don't know that Baeza is going to be able to do that. 8,700 is a bit much. I'm going to have more Fialo than I have Baeza, especially for the salary relief. Um, give me Baeza maybe one lineup in five, maybe. 20 lineups, maybe like three. Maybe four if I'm looking to like fade a couple of 9,000 guys. Uh, maybe four or five. And then in the 150s, I mean, 8,700, that's such a tough salary to get to, honestly. Because the 9,000 guys are usually much better as far as upside. But some of those like 82, 8,000 guys are easier to get to because they're not as expensive. So 150 lineups, give me 10% Baeza, something like that. Uh, Fialo, I'm going to play him for his upside. I'm going to play him for the upside that Baeza slows down and maybe Fialo can get something going later on. Hopefully he improved his cardio. Not going crazy on this one. Uh, in five lineups, probably like two for some salary relief. 20 lineups, you know, seven, seven to eight, and then 150, probably close to 35, 30 to 35%, mostly for salary relief. But I do think Fialo has a good chance to beat Baeza. I don't think the UFC necessarily brings guys in so they can lose their first two fights. Um, but at the same time, this is not an easy fight. Baeza is a tough, tough opponent. Give me Fialo for the upset, though. Oh, main event. This one's going to go pretty quick, guys. Uh, Cal Barajo going against Godzi Omar Godzi Omar Gajev. I thought I, I, I practiced it for hours before this, guys. Just hours. Godzi Omar Gajev. Um... Both Dana White Contender Series uh, guys. In fact, Barallo has two Dana White Contender Series fights, two wins, and just one for Godzi. Um, 8,400 for Godzi. He would have scored 4.13 points per minute in that fight, giving up only 0.32 points a minute back at him. Incredible. Just a stifling. And this is over three and a half minutes, or four and a half minutes. So it's not a super quick first round knockout. He didn't let any points come at him. 107 is what he would have scored. Baraglio, Barajo on the other side, 4.37 points a minute, allowing 2.25, so very good differential. 96 average in his wins, 1.23 power index. My goodness, just whooping his opponent's asses. Uh, you can't take much into this, guys, because it's uh, Dana White Contender Series fights, and their opponents are not great. Um, so, I mean, tons of takedown points and control time for Godzi. Tons of all kinds of points for Baraglio. Um this is going to be like a pick em. I think one of these guys is going to make the optimal lineup. I think the schedule has got to go to uh, Barajo. Barajo? I keep thinking it's Barajo. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not up to date on my Portuguese. Um, but uh, Omar Gajev has just a terrible strength of schedule. Under 60 in every category, pretty much. Um, keep this one short and sweet. I think someone is making the optimal lineup here. This is pretty much going to be 100%. Exposure for me. A couple of graphs that are pretty meaningless because we only have one fight for uh, Godzi. And then tons of finishes when they win. Godzi is 13 and 0 as a pro. Barajo, 10 and 1. I mean, tons of finishes. 11 out of 13 finishes for Godzi. And what do we got? 7 out of 10 finishes for Barajo. So pick one of these guys. Um, you know, I'm pretty much going to be 50 50. I'm pretty much going to be 50-50, I think. Maybe 60-40 for Omar uh, Omar Gajev uh, at 8,400 because I think you're getting a steal on both of these guys. Uh, either one of them could put up well over 100 points. I'm picking Godzi for the takedown upside. I think I think he probably... No, do your fight tape on this one, but I think he probably wins this fight 60% of the time, 65. So give me about those odds. In five lineups, give me three Godzi, two Barajo. In 20 lineups, give me, you know, 12, 13 Godzi and uh, 5 to 6 Barajo. And in 150s, give me 60% Godzi and 30 to 35 Barajo. I think that's a pretty good chance. I think one of these guys makes the optimal, um, and one of them looks real good doing it. So that's kind of what I think. Main event of the evening, and we are under an hour, boys. Let's go, boys and girls. Sorry. Vicente, uh, Vicente Luque going against Bilal Muhammad. Um, this is going to be a fantastic fight. 
Uh, Luke A won the first one, I believe, in the first round. Um, 8,500 is Luke A. 3.62 points a minute, allows four, uh, 3.46 back at him. Coming in $285 cheaper than his average salary. So you're getting a deal on him. Luke A also coming in with the highest DraftKings points per win number at 106. 0.96 number one on the entire card giving up only 90 uh, 92 when he loses so fantastic numbers from luke a below muhammad seventy seven hundred dollars i mean what a fantastic salary for both of these guys he is also seven hundred dollars under his average salary can you imagine both main event fighters under their average salary what a day friends what a day 3.54 points per minute so just behind luke a, uh as far as pace on the card allows though only 2.06 points per minute, second best defensive pace on the card. That is huge. Two points a minute, just shutting people down. Scores only 88.61 when he wins. But as we saw, when he has five rounds to work, like he did in his last fight, guys, again, or no, that this is a three-round fight. Excuse me. This was not a five-round fight against Stephen Thompson. He put up 132, and he took down Stephen Thompson seven times. Um... I mean, Luke, 92% of his wins over 90 uh, points, 79% of his wins over 100 points, and 36% over 110. So you cannot fade either guy here. You just cannot. Bilal, 45% of his wins over 90 scores 0.73 points a minute in takedowns, 0.5 points a minute in control time. Meanwhile, Luke is giving up 0.5 points a minute in takedowns and 0.32 points a minute in control time. Luke is susceptible to takedowns and being controlled, but when he is on the ground, and I'm sure Bilal is extra careful because he's been doing this for years, but Luke can absolutely submit you with no problem. I mean, he's got five UFC submissions, eight in his professional career. You saw what he did to Michael Chiesa with that Darce choke at the very first round after getting uh, taken down and controlled for 30% of the fight. All of a sudden, Michael Chiesa was in a Darce choke and he was tapping out. So he also tapped Tyron Woodley before that. Um, I mean, the guy is no joke on the ground. Bilal Muhammad has a clear path to victory here. Stay smart on the ground. Take Luke down, control him, stay on top, ground and pound. Stay freaking smart. You'll win a decision here. Um, I like both guys. I'm going to be playing both sides of this fight. Here are my DraftKings graphs. Here are my projections. Cannot forget the projections. Very high for both guys. This is a five-round fight. I mean, Bilal, either one. I mean, the longer this goes, I think the better it is for Bilal Muhammad, obviously. Uh, he's got the cardio advantage. I'm pretty sure he's got the huge wrestling advantage. Um, but Luke has the submission advantage and the um, possibly the reversal advantage as well. But it all depends on if Bilal can keep his good base. Just be smart on the ground. He has shown fantastic fight IQ uh, with where he places his head. So where he places his arms, being sure to get out of trouble. I mean, you saw him against Damian Maya. Uh, you know, come on. Damian Maya is one of the best jujitsu practitioners in, in the world. I don't even care how old he was. Uh, so, yeah. Here are the uh, visual statistic, statistical recap. I cannot talk tonight. Um, Luke a with a huge real estate here. Big chunk of the graph missing for Muhammad as he has pretty many, pretty much no finish wins. Very, very few. One in the UFC, actually. Then here are the professional career finishing percentages. Pretty high for Luke. Uh, pretty high in wins overall. About 60%. Then, you know, about 23% total. Or actually 30% total in their career. Same height. Luke's got a three-inch reach. I think Luke gets it done early. First or second round. Or... Bilal Muhammad wins by decision. I'm going to be playing both sides of this fight. I'm going to have more Bilal Muhammad than Vicente Luque. Um, I just think the takedown upside and control time upside for Muhammad is absolutely tremendous. You saw what he did against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, putting up 130-some points in 15 minutes. Now, I don't think he takes... Maybe he does take Luque down seven times. Who knows? Um, but I really like the upside for Bilal Muhammad here. In five lineups, give me Bilal in three, three or four, and give me Luke in the other one or two. Um, 20 lineups, give me Bilal in, I don't know, 12 to 14, and give me Luke in, you know, pretty much the other eight to 10, or uh, sorry, six to eight. 
And then 150s, I mean, I'm rocking 50% Bilal, 35% Luque, something like that. So I really like the upside for Bilal here, but I'm going to keep a high exposure for me, which is about 35% or so on Vicente Luque because 106.96 points per win. I mean, come on. And the fact that, I mean, Bilal's only been finished once, but Luque is definitely a guy that can finish you. So give me a little bit of him for the upside. That's going to do it, guys. We did it. All 13 fights. Let's check out Computer Monk's picks. Bottom to top, we've got Haile Alatang by decision, Estela Nunes by decision, Jordan Levitt by finish, Martin Bude by finish, Rafa Garcia decision, Drakkar close decision, Penny Kianza decision, William Knight decision, Pat Sabatini finish, Myra Bueno Silva finish, mm, Miguel Baeza finish, Gadzi Omargajev finish, and Vicente Luque, or sorry, Gadzi decision, and Vicente Luque decision as well. My goodness, check this out, guys. So two weeks ago, Computer Monk did terribly. We saw that last week. Four wrong, or four right, eight wrong. I said, we need to come back. He only missed one, and it was the Aljo win. The one I picked Aljo to win, but Computer Monk went against me. He went 11 and one last week. We are back over. Oh, you can't see it. I'll scroll up. We are back over 60%, baby. Computer Monk stats are winning 60.4% of the time making the right pick. So let's keep that going. I want to be over 62% by the end of the week. Guys, I think that's it. I think we covered all every all the numbers, all everything that you need to know for UFC Vegas 51 from a Draft Kings perspective. One more time, be sure to like the video and please uh, subscribe to the channel. Like I said, I'm only five away from 200. Help me hit that milestone. And be sure to leave a comment down below. Tell me what you like, didn't like, what you would like to hear, etc. I really appreciate you sticking around with me, guys. Thank you so much. One more time, check out. How come I can't do my fingers? There we go. Teamriserfall.com. Go to the website. Use code MONK. Save yourself $10 on a subscription, guys. Man, it's been a lot of fun. Be sure to stick around. I got two brand new videos coming out later this week. Uh, probably tomorrow, Wednesday, they're going to be about five to 10 minutes each about fades and plays for the week. So be sure to check that out. Um, and then the Wednesday show DraftKings on pub sports, radio, me, Brady, Wheezy, and Luke breaking down a couple of fights, giving you our fades, our plays, our lineups, our lineups from last week, all kinds of stuff. Spoiler alert. I did not win a fifth time in a row. I know it's very sad, but then Friday, uh, happy hour with Monk and Lou on the MMA engine. Be sure to subscribe and like that as well. That's going to be at 4.30 p.m. Central on Friday. So, guys, thanks again. Uh, and, I mean, I don't know what else to say. That's it. Thanks again. As always, I hope you enjoy the fights. So, enjoy. See you next time. Peace out.